Today, the Committee on Oversight and Reform is holding its second hearing on the January 6th insurrection. As we examine the events of that day, we must keep at the forefront that January 6th was the deadly culmination of weeks of increasingly desperate efforts by former President Trump to prevent the peaceful transfer of power and overturn the lawful results of the 2020 presidential election. Just this morning, the committee released documents we obtained showing that in the weeks leading up to January 6th attack, President Trump repeatedly pressured the Department of Justice to overturn the election he had lost. President Trump sent bogus election fraud claims to Jeffrey Rosen just minutes before he announced on Twitter that he was appointing Mr. Rosen as acting attorney general. When that didn't work, President Trump used official White House channels and a private attorney to pressure DOJ to file a lawsuit in the Supreme Court to nullify the election, but only in states he lost. When the department refused, President Trump attempted to replace Mr. Rosen with another DOJ official who appeared willing to embrace these conspiracy theories and further the president's corrupt ends. In an email released by the committee, one DOJ official called the conspiracy theories pushed by the White House, quote, pure insanity, end quote. After his efforts to pressure the Department of Justice failed, President Trump grew even more desperate. And so on the morning of January 6th, he sent an angry, violent mob to the Capitol. The goal was to use violence to stop Congress from certifying that Joe Biden won the election. In other words, Donald Trump was attempting to instigate a coup or to use his own words as he gave literal marching orders that morning, President Trump wanted the rioters to, quote, walk down to the Capitol, fight like hell, stop the steal, end quote. And the rioters responded. They marched to the Capitol, forced their way inside, violently attacked the police, and put the lives of the Vice President, members of Congress, and their staff in grave danger. Thanks to the bravery of our law enforcement, including the U.S. Capitol Police and D.C.'s Metropolitan Police Department, the mob was defeated and Congress certified the results of a free and fair election. But make no mistake, the men and women on the front lines of that battle faced terrible odds on January 6. They were beaten, bludgeoned, and pepper sprayed. Many officers from the Capitol Police lacked the equipment and proper training to confront such a violent mob, and others felt they did not receive the instructions and support from superiors that they needed as conditions deteriorated. Is the chairwoman muted? No. Last I week, in consultation with Ranking Member Comer, the committee invited the acting chief of the Capitol Police, Yogananda Pittman, to testify today about these challenges. I am very disappointed that Chief Pittman has declined to appear today. However, she has committed to testify, and I can announce today that she will appear before this committee on July 21st. The Capitol Police were gravely unprepared on January 6th, but they could not be expected to repel the worst attack on the Capitol in 200 years on their own. Unfortunately, our committee's investigation has revealed that the federal government failed to sound the alarm before January 6 and was slow to respond once the attack occurred. Today, we are joined by three witness, witnesses who can shed light on those failures. First, we are joined by FBI Director Christopher Wray. The FBI is our nation's leading law enforcement agency and is tasked with preventing domestic terrorism. In the weeks before January 6, online forums erupted with threats of violence against lawmakers and the Capitol. 
One FBI field office warned that violent extremists were preparing for, quote, war, end quote. Yet the FBI failed to use all of its tools to warn of the looming assault. It did not use or issue a formal intelligence bulletin about the threat, and it did not pass on key intelligence to the leaders of the Capitol Police. Five months after the attack, we still do not have the full story of these failures because the FBI and Department of Justice have not fully cooperated with this committee's investigation. This delay is unacceptable, and it makes us more vulnerable to yet another attack. Today, we also welcome General Charles Flynn and Lieutenant General Walter Pyatt, who worked on the Army staff on January 6. Neither of these career military officers was in the direct chain of command on January 6, but they both participated in key discussions about how the National Guard should respond. That response took far too long. Documents obtained by the committee show that beginning at 1.30 p.m., top officials at the Defense Department received at least 12 urgent requests for help from the Capitol Police, the mayor, and other officials. But after a series of delays, the National Guard did not arrive until 5.20 p.m., more than four hours after the Capitol perimeter was breached. This is a shocking failure, and today we intend to get to the bottom of why it happened. At our last hearing, I was deeply dismayed that some of my Republican colleagues denied basic truths about that day. So let's be clear. The attack was an insurrection. It was not a peaceful protest or a normal tourist visit. It was an insurrection. You don't have to take my word for it. The top Republicans in Congress, Senate Minority Leader McConnell and Republican Leader McCarthy, have both acknowledged that the events of January 6 were, quote, an insurrection, end quote. As the next step in our investigation, the committee has requested transcribed interviews with former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, who directly pressured DOJ officials at least five times to investigate false claims of election fraud. We also plan to interview former Acting Attorney General Jeffrey Rosen and other senior officials with firsthand knowledge of President Trump's campaign to overturn the 2020 election. We must never forget the horrific events we witnessed in January or dishonor those who risked their lives to protect ours. This committee will continue to fulfill its duty and investigate the attack on January 6 with every means at its disposal. Before I conclude, I would like to play a short video to remind everyone of exactly what transpired on that day. Please play the video. Yes, 
the distinguished ranking member, Mr. Comer, for an opening statement. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And before I begin my remarks on today's hearing, I just wanted to follow up on some of the comments that, uh, that you made at the beginning of the hearing, uh, referencing uh, flouting the rules and things like that. I think we were all on the House floor last night, and we saw what I haven't seen since before the pandemic. There were probably 325, 350 members all on the House floor for probably 30 minutes voting. I saw maybe 10 members who had masks on. I believe they were on your side of the aisle. And it was like we were back to normal in the House of Representatives, just like uh, I've made a couple of trips to Washington, to the downtown area over the last two days. And you know, in the restaurants, they're not requiring masks. The restaurants are back at full capacity. And we need to be back at full capacity and operate just like we are back to normal because we are. We've made great progress with this. And, you know, what we're hearing when we spent the last three weeks traveling the district, all of our districts, listening to the job creators and, and the employers of America, they're frustrated because they can't find workers. It's a bigger problem than inflation. It's a bigger problem than all of these uh, Biden policies that are starting to kick in and, and be so detrimental to our economy. The biggest problem is the lack of workers. And we need to demonstrate in Congress, we need to show leadership that we're back to normal. We're going to get back to normal. We're going to get back to work in person. And that's what we are very happy to demonstrate here today. So I just wanted to make that statement, and I certainly hope that we can continue uh, the, the work and the demonstration that uh, we're leading on this, and that we can have in-person hearings with in-person witnesses, and that we can get back to normal and do the business of the people. We would love to have uh, a lot of hearings, and we send you letters almost uh, every other day requesting certain hearings. Uh, we, when you talk about the rules, We've requested many times to have Dr. Fauci come and explain what he meant in those emails that have become public. We would love to ask questions uh, as we try to lead and get our economy back to normal. So there are a lot of things that I think this committee can do together in a bipartisan way, and I'm glad to see everybody back in the committee room. And uh, we'll get started with today's hearing. And I must say, today's hearing appears to be part of a pattern by Democrats to hold unproductive partisan hearings to advance a political narrative rather than make our government more efficient, transparent, and accountable to the American people. Last week, this committee held its second hearing on the opioid crisis by discussing a bankruptcy bill that, is, that isn't even in this committee's jurisdiction. The Democrat star witness for that hearing was a Democrat donor and book author who had no knowledge of bankruptcy and provided zero new information to this committee. In what has become a trend, this week, 
the committee is holding its second hearing on the events of January 6th. This second hearing will also likely provide no new information. That's because the Democrat star witness, FBI Director Christopher Wray, has already testified multiple times before Congress about the events of January 6th. In fact, just last week, he testified for five hours before the House Judiciary Committee, answering dozens of questions that will likely get repeated for him here today. Last month, the committee's first hearing on the events of January 6th uncovered absolutely zero new information. Even CNN called the hearing unproductive. Democrats seemed upset that witnesses could not answer questions due to longstanding executive branch privileges and interests privileges and interests that have been upheld by the courts for generations. So today, the Democrats want to try again. Unfortunately, they aren't going to do much better. Director Ray cannot talk about ongoing investigations and ongoing matters. It's the nature of his job, and it's the same stance held by his predecessors. The Democrats know this. Just like last week, however, the second hearing isn't about gathering facts. It's about gathering political points. Director Ray is here for one reason only, and that is to add an aura of credibility to this overtly political hearing. That's because the Democrats have invited none other than Michael Flynn's brother, Charles Flynn. They've also invited Lieutenant General Walter Pyatt, Combined, these two individuals have nearly 80 years of decorated service in the U.S. Army. They were not in the chain of command on January 6th. They did not have the ability to order troops to move or to order them to stay on January 6th. They didn't have that ability. Democrats want them to testify about a single phone call on January 6th that they may or may not have been on, let alone participated in. If Democrats really wanted answers, they would have demanded or subpoenaed Acting Chief Pittman to testify at one of their two hearings on the January 6th attacks. Instead, they left it to us, the committee Republicans, to invite the Acting Chief, which we did. Of course, unfortunately, the minority does not have subpoena power. Pittman served as the head of the Capitol Police Intelligence Unit on January the 6th. I mean, how can you have a credible hearing, much less two credible hearings on January 6th, when you don't invite the acting Capitol Police Chief, who just so happened to be in, in charge of intelligence on January 6th? Given last week's bipartisan Senate report outlining her ineffectiveness leading up to January 6th, her presence here today would have been productive. But she declined to be here today. Instead, she is in her office just steps away from this room watching another hearing on TV, a hearing that she claims she may need to respond to in some fashion. It's no wonder that 92% of the rank and file disapprove of the job she is doing. Every one of us here wants answers, but because she never worked for President Trump, the Democrats have shown no inclination to compel her testimony. It seems her testimony wouldn't fit into Democrats' constructive, partisan narrative of the events of that day. Unfortunately, politics is only lens through which Democrats seem to conduct committee business these days. It's why the committee held several hearings during the previous administration about conditions at the border. Yet now, when the crisis is far worse and illegal border crossings are at a 20-year high, Chairwoman Maloney refuses to hold a hearing. We first asked for a hearing over 100 days ago, but the only response we've gotten is crickets. And with mounting evidence COVID-19 originated from the Wuhan lab, Republicans have repeatedly called on Democrats to investigate the origins of the virus to help prevent future pandemics. But Democrats have refused. Instead of holding communist China accountable, Democrats say they will only continue to investigate the Trump administration. Under the leadership of Democrats, this committee is not about finding the truth. It's not about conducting meaningful oversight. It's only about politics. It's past time, Democrats, to get back to this committee's mission of identifying and preventing government waste, fraud, abuse, and mismanagement, and ensuring the federal government is effective, efficient, transparent, and accountable to the American people. Today's partisan hearing 
fails our committee's mission. The American people deserve answers about the attack on the U.S. Capitol and expect transparency and accountability from their leaders. But sadly, today's hearing shows Democrats continue to prioritize politics over the American people. Madam Chairman, I sadly yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, Ms. Pittman will be testifying before the committee on July 21st. Now I would like to introduce our witnesses. Our first witness today is the Honorable Christopher Wray, who is the Director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Then we will hear from Lieutenant General Walter Pyatt, who is the Director of the Army Staff. Finally, we will hear from General Charles Flynn, who is the Commanding General of the U.S. Army Pacific. The witnesses will be unmuted so we can swear them in. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I swear. Let the record show that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Thank you. Without objection, your written statements will be made part of the record. With that, Director Ray, you are now recognized for your testimony. Good afternoon, Chairman Maloney, Ranking Member Comer, and members of the committee. Thank you for this opportunity to talk about the FBI's work leading up to and following the siege here at the Capitol on January 6th. It's been more than five months since the violence and destruction of that day, and I'm no less appalled today than I was then and no less determined to do our part to make sure that it never happens again. On January 6th, our country witnessed an angry mob attack the U.S. Capitol in a failed attempt to interfere with our democratic process, an assault where you, the members of Congress, were victims, but where all Americans, in a sense, were victimized, and more than 100 law enforcement officers were injured in just a few hours. Such acts of domestic terrorism are an affront to the rule of law and have no place in our democracy. And the FBI's agents, analysts, and professionals, alongside our partners, have been working around the clock to track down those who participated in the attack to hold them accountable. We've already made close to 500 arrests, with more sure to come. Unfortunately, January 6th wasn't an isolated event. Domestic terrorism has been and continues to be a top concern for the FBI, so much so that over the past three years, we doubled our domestic terrorism investigations and arrests, in no small part because of the rise in racially and ethnically motivated violent extremists, which I elevated to our highest threat priority level back in 2019, and because of the rise in violence from anti-government, anti-authority actors over the past year, including on January 6th. I've also repeatedly highlighted the severity of the threat more than a dozen times in testimony over the years since I took office. Now, thankfully, the FBI is far from alone in this fight. Earlier today, Attorney General Garland announced the first ever national strategy for countering domestic terrorism. The strategy calls for a sweeping response to the pervasive domestic terrorism problem, one that demands attention from all of us. It serves as a commitment from the U.S. government to work with our state, local, and foreign partners, and with private sector partners to share domestic terrorism-related information, prevent domestic terrorism recruitment and mobilization to violence, and disrupt terrorist activity here in the homeland before it happens. It's also a thoughtful response that carefully balances American safety and security with the civil rights and civil liberties we all cherish. Before I take your questions, I do want to talk for just a moment about an issue that was front and center during the riots on January 6th and that also hits very close to home at the Bureau. Over the past year, we've seen a troubling uptick in violence against members of the law enforcement community. That's not just counting the Capitol attack on January 6th or the attacks against hundreds of officers across the country during the civil unrest last summer. We're also seeing it, tragically, in the number of line of duty deaths. In just the first five months of 2021, 37 officers have been murdered on the job. 
far surpassing the number from this time last year. I put that in perspective. That's almost two law enforcement officers violently killed every week. And that's not counting all those officers who died in the line of duty facing the countless other inherent dangers of the job, like from a car accident in pursuit after a subject or drowning during an attempted rescue, or even the scores of officers who died from COVID-19 because of course law enforcement kept coming to work every day despite the pandemic. Nor is it counting all those officers who've been badly, badly injured on duty and thankfully survived, but whose lives and whose families' lives are forever changed as a result. Now the loss of any agent or officer is heartbreaking for their families, for their agencies and for the communities they serve. We in the FBI know that all too well with the terrible loss of Special Agents Laura Schwarzenberger and Dan Alfin who were shot and killed down near Miami just this past February. Since I came on board as director, I've made it a point to know when any officer is shot and killed in the line of duty anywhere in the United States. I read about their career and about their family before personally calling the chief or sheriff of their department to offer mine and the FBI's condolences and support. Since August of 2017, when I started in this job, I've made more than 200 of those calls. Now with each one, I think about the family members, friends and colleagues rocked by the loss of a loved one, the careers cut short and the communities hurting. And I bring this up today because if we're not careful, we could find ourselves taking for granted the sacrifices law enforcement officers and agents make every day to keep all of us safe. It takes a pretty special person to get up in the morning and be willing to put his or her life on the line for a total stranger. And to do that every day, year after year after year for an entire career is extraordinary. So we owe a debt of gratitude and a heck of a lot of respect to the brave men and women who choose to protect and serve their fellow Americans. People like the Capitol Police and Metro PD officers who bravely defended you and this building on January 6th. And especially those who've made the ultimate sacrifice like Dan Alphen and Lauren Schwarzenberger, whose memories we honor every day through our work, along with the countless others we as a nation have lost throughout the years. All of us, all of us here today have a shared responsibility to take a stand, to protect our communities, to support those who serve in law enforcement and to condemn violence regardless of its motivation. And we in the FBI are ready to use all the tools at our disposal to do just that, to uphold the rule of law and to fulfill our mission to protect every American. Thank you for this opportunity to appear before you today and for your continued support of the FBI. I look forward to your questions. Thank, thank you for your testimony. Lieutenant General Pyatt, you are now recognized for your testimony, Lieutenant General. Good morning, everybody. Ranking Member Comer. And distinguished members of the House Committee on Oversight and Reform. Good afternoon. My name is Walter Pyatt. I serve as the director of the Army staff. Thank you for the invitation to appear before this committee to speak to you about the Army's actions in support of the events that took place on January 6th in our nation's capital. Before I begin, I would like to extend my sincere and lasting gratitude to the brave men and women who heroically defended the Capitol on January 6th and without question saved many lives. I also wish to extend my deepest sympathy to the families who lost loved ones that day. On the days leading to 6 January, my role was to assist then Secretary of the Army, Ryan McCarthy, and to ensure that the Army staff provided the DC National Guard with the resources they required to accomplish their mission. The Army's role on 6 January began as unarmed support by the DC National Guard to the Metropolitan Police. By midday, the mission had changed drastically to respond to the attack on the Capitol. That change in mission was unforeseen and we were not positioned to respond with immediate support. My involvement with our response to this emergency began shortly after entering the Secretary of the Army's office 
at 2.20 p.m. to provide a report of a suspicious package. While I was there, a panic call came in reporting several explosions in the city. To understand the situation and to identify what was needed from the Army, Secretary McCarthy convened a conference call. During this call, D.C. and Capitol authorities frantically requested urgent and immediate support to the Capitol. We all immediately understood the gravity of the situation. Secretary McCarthy ran down the hall to seek approval from the Acting Secretary of Defense. Before departing, he directed me to have the staff prepare a response. I communicated this on the conference call, but those on the line were convinced that I was denying their request which I did not have the authority to do. Despite clearly stating three times that we are not denying your request, we need to prepare a plan for when the Secretary of the Army gains approval. While I was still on the phone, then Lieutenant General Flynn rushed to establish a secure planning session with all the right staff personnel we were going to need to prepare for this new mission. Lieutenant General Flynn's immediate interpretation of the urgency of the situation allowed the Army staff to begin identifying the many critical actions and considerations we needed to address and address rapidly. We needed to redeploy the DC National Guard from 37 locations throughout the district, alert and recall soldiers from their civilian workplace, organize into unit configurations, equip the force, prepare an employment plan to include communications, specific routes, link up locations, casualty evacuation, the rules for the use of force, determine if the DC Guard would be armed or not armed, with or without riot control gear, and how and where the DC National Guard would be deputized to support federal law enforcement. While we continued planning, the Secretary of the Army went into the district and met with Chief Conte and Mayor Bowser to coordinate for the commitment of the DC National Guard. The Secretary surveyed the Capitol to establish where the best link up point would be. By 4.32, we had an approved plan, and at 4.35 p.m., the Secretary of the Army ordered the D.C. National Guard to move to the Capitol and begin establishing perimeter security. Once the D.C. National Guard was committed, the Army staff continued to prepare and conduct planning to receive additional forces, identify what barrier material would be needed and where it could be found, how it would be contracted for, and employed and in place to enhance the protection of the Capitol. On January 6th, our capital was attacked, breached, and penetrated. Your lives, those of your staff, the U.S. Capitol Police, and many others were threatened by a dangerous mob. Our collective mission now is to learn from this event and ensure an event like this never happens again. I hope that my testimony today will prove useful to that end. Thank you. I am prepared to answer your questions. Thank you for your testimony. General Flynn, you are now recognized for your testimony. General Flynn. Chairwoman Maloney, Ranking Member Comer, members of this committee, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you and speak about the Army's actions in response to the event in our nation's capital on January 6th. I served as the Deputy Chief of Staff at G357, the equivalent of the Chief Operating Officer for the Army's 1.2 million soldiers. I was in charge of operations, plans, training, and strategy. As an American citizen, I was shocked and I was angered at the events of January 6th. As a soldier devoted to upholding our constitution, I performed my duties and responded to the unfortunate events that occurred that day. To that end, I will address two areas today, my organization's activities and my individual actions. In the days prior to January 6th, the DC authorities submitted a request for federal forces to support an unarmed non-law enforcement mission by the DC National Guard. That request focused on support to draft traffic control points 
and crowd management near metro stations. The Army received no other requests for assistance. The DC National Guard then determined this re request would require roughly 350 unarmed soldiers to cover two separate shifts. This included a 40 person quick reaction force at Joint Base Andrews and that quick reaction force was intended to augment crowd control and establish traffic control points if required. The DC National Guard equipped those soldiers and airmen with body armors and helmets, which were stored in nearby government vehicles. Riot control gear, such as shields, leg protection, and full face shields remain stored at the DC Guard Armory. Because the National Guard forces, including the Quick Reaction Force, were never requested to serve as a riot control force. My director of current operations, a brigadier general, validated these requirements and with Secretary McCarthy's endorsement, Acting SecDef Miller approved the request and assigned the mission on Monday, January the 4th. I'll now transition and describe my actions on January the 6th. Early that afternoon, I was holding a meeting in my office. At approximately 2.21, I was alerted that the Capitol was under attack and that Secretary McCarthy's office had requested me to move to his office. Not, not yet knowing the scope of the problem, I moved quickly to Secretary McCarthy's office. I saw him walking out while giving instructions to numerous staff members that were already in the room. He was already on his way to meet with acting SecDef Miller. My director of current operations, a brigadier general, was with him. Continuing further into his office, I saw the director of the Army staff, Lieutenant General Pyatt, in the rear of the room. He was standing over a speakerphone, and he was the only person in the office speaking on the call. Reaching his side, I recall hearing an unidentified person on the other end of the speakerphone tensely ask, are you denying our request? General Pyatt responded with words to the effect, I am not denying your request. I am waiting for an answer from Secretary McCarthy, who is with the acting Secretary of Defense presently. In the meantime, we should develop a plan. Seconds later, I recall a second question from a second unidentified person who asked, and to be clear, are you denying our request for National Guard forces to be used. General Pyatt's response was similar to his first statement. I immediately realized the gravity of the situation and it was very, very serious. Both speakers on the phone sounded highly agitated and even panicked. I recognized General Pyatt's calm demeanor. It was a combat experienced leader reacting to an otherwise violent and unpredictable event. I then realized, as General Pyatt has said, the situation required the Army staff to rapidly develop and execute a plan. As the Chief Operating Officer, I needed to initiate those efforts with absolute urgency, and I did. Having been in the room for roughly four minutes, I quickly moved to my office and began coordinating with numerous Army staff leaders across our large staff and across other Army commands so that we could rapidly facilitate and execute any decisions made by Secretary McCarthy and Acting Secretary of Defense Miller. This team of over 40 officers and non-commissioned officers immediately worked to recall the 154 DC National Guard personnel from their current missions, reorganize them, re-equip them, and begin to redeploy them to the Capitol. We also began to coordinate for the arrival of neighboring states that were committing National Guard forces into the District of Columbia. Simultaneously, we had to gather materials, do surveys, and plan for barrier materials to be moved to the Capitol in order to protect that institution and you. 
and many, many other tasks. This work continued with utter focus and urgency throughout the night of January 6th and well afterwards. The DC National Guard's airmen and soldiers response that day on, the Janu on January 6th is an absolute testament to their dedication to duty and their unquestionable defense of the Constitution of the United States. However, the events of January 6th must never be able to occur again. We must address the circumstances that allowed it to happen. Thank you for conducting this hearing. Thank you for asking me to appear before you. And thank you for seeking my perspectives on the Army's actions that day. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, General Flynn. Uh, I now recognize myself for five minutes for questions. Uh, Director Ray, stopping terrorism is the FBI's top investigative priority. On January 6th, the Capitol was overrun by domestic terrorists, and it has been, become clear that the FBI failed to take threats of violence seriously enough before the attack. Director Ray, when you testified before the Judiciary Committee last week, you said, and I quote, aware of online chatter about the potential for violence, but were, quote, not aware that we had any intelligence indicating that hundreds of individuals were going to storm the Capitol itself, end quote. But the threats, I would say, were everywhere. The Norfolk Field FBI office notified your office. The Washington Post and other newspapers were writing about it. It was on radio, it was on television, it was on other social media streams. The system was blinking red. The committee has obtained documents showing that social media company Parler sent the FBI evidence of planned violence in Washington, D.C. on January 6. Parler referred this content to the FBI for investigation over 50 times. And according to the company, quote, even alerted law enforcement to specific threats of violence being planned at the Capitol, end quote. I'd li like to ask about one tip in particular. The committee has obtained an email in which an employee from Parler shared a social media post with an FBI liaison. In that post, a Parler user stated, and I quote, this is not a rally. It's no longer a protest. This is a final stand where we are drawing a red line at Capitol Hill, end quote. The user later said, and I quote, don't be surprised if we take the Capitol building, end quote. The user concluded, Trump needs us to cause chaos to enact the Insurrection Act, end quote. This information was passed to the FBI on January 2nd. Director Ray, were you made aware this email from Parler prior to January 6th, yes or no? Were you aware of this uh, communication from Parler? Well, Maloney, I do not recall uh, hearing about this particular email, uh, certainly not before January 6th. Were you aware of the 50 times that Parler tried to contact your office about an insurrection? I'm not aware of Parler ever trying to contact my office. Uh, I am aware since January 6th that Parler uh, has made some comments about its communications with the FBI. My understanding is that they send emails to a particular field office and that some of those contain possible threat information and some of them were referred to domestic terrorism squads for follow-up and we've been taking a hard look at the various emails that Parler sent. Uh, to assess the accuracy of their assertions uh, and whether further action is warranted. You also mentioned the You're, Norfolk yeah. report, and I guess I just I, I do want to be clear that that information, uh, raw, unverified information, as unfortunately so much of the information these days is on social media, uh, was quickly passed to all of our partners uh, in three different ways. Uh, almost immediately. So I, I do want to be clear about that particular piece. Well, Director we did Ray, over the Ray, course of the period. I'm no, sorry. Reclaiming my time. Director Ray, do you know sure. whether the FBI took any action in response, not just to the alarming email, but to the 
the national media. The Washington Post reported on it. It was on radio, television. It, it was everywhere. Uh, uh, did you take any reaction to any of these alarming notifications that there was a planned insurrection at, at the White House? Or, no, not well, at the Capitol, at the Capitol. So a couple things. First, over the course of the period leading up to January 6th, we put out, I think, a dozen or so uh, intelligence products, including two bulletins in particular, uh, specifically raising concerns about domestic violent extremism, specifically raising concerns about domestic violent extremism related to the election, and specifically related to domestic violent extremism continuing past election day itself, right on up to the time of the certification and even the inauguration. And that's in addition to some 500 or something uh, field office intelligence products that were pushed out, raw intelligence that were pushed out to our partners uh, along the way. Uh, in addition, so, we- Reclaiming my time, Director Ray, yep. do you agree that the FBI shares some blame for the failures on January 6th? Do you take any responsibility for these failures? Uh, Chairwoman, I think the best way for me to answer that question is that our goal is to bat a thousand, and anytime there's an attack, much less much less an attack as horrific and spectacular as what happened on January 6th. We consider that to be unacceptable, and we are absolutely determined to make sure that we're doing our part with our partners to make sure it never happens again. So you can be confident. Okay. That, that's that good that you are, are making that commitment, reclaiming my time. Will you commit to conducting an assessment of what went right and what went wrong at the FBI before January 6th? And, and providing this assessment to the public and to the committee? Evaluating how we can do better. I also want to make sure that I don't get in the way of, as you may know, there's a Department of Justice Inspector General review that I think is relevant to this as well. And so I I'm going to be very interested uh, in hearing what the Inspector General Well, concludes. I would say so we'll that uh, the Inspector that. General uh, has a different role. I think it's very normal to ha assess what went right and what went wrong during a crisis. Uh, we are asking for an assessment. I, I would as assume that you would be doing one. And just yes or no, will you provide us with the assessment to the committee of what went right, what went wrong? And you said you want to make sure this never happens again. What are the steps the FBI are taking that this never does happen again. I think that's we'd, a very be, fair and reasonable request. Absolutely. I, there's no, no problem with, uh, with us trying to give you more information about the changes that we're making, the improvements, enhancements we're making to ensure that this doesn't uh, happen again. And, and I, I must uh, conclude by saying that we're very disappointed at the response uh, from the FBI on the document requests that we have sent uh, out with five other committee chairmen. We sent it back uh, in March, nearly three months ago. And will you, yes or no, commit today to providing a complete response to these requests by the end of this month? I know that we've been trying to do our part to get you the right information. I know we've produced about 500 or so pages uh, of intelligence products, uh, but I agree that we need to do better and have to move faster. And I've asked my staff to look for ways to expedite the process. Uh, I do want to be clear uh, that it is trickier than it might sound. And the reason for that, which is an important reason that I want the whole committee to understand, is that we are uh, totally immersed right now in making sure that our ongoing investigations and now 500 or so prosecutions to hold accountable the people who assaulted you all go forward uh, and are protected. And so managing the document production while protecting the integrity of those cases with some very strong-willed judges who have very clear views about publicity and things like well, that are things that we Document production manage, is very, we very important. We expect you to comply with it. I now recognize the gentlelady from North Carolina, Mrs. Fox. You're now recognized, Mrs. Fox. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. General Flynn, Generals Flynn and Pyatt, thank you for dedicating your lives to the service of our nation. I also give my profound thanks to all the police officers in this country who, and the Capitol Police who risk their lives every day to protect us and others. 
As I stated at part one of this hearing on May 12th, if the goal of this hearing is to explore the circumstances surrounding January 6th and why it happened as it did, I would expect to see Capitol Police at this hearing, end quote. And the very title of this hearing, Unexplained Delays and Unanswered Questions, begs the issue of why the acting chief of the Capitol Police is not here. Republicans have asked the chairwoman to invite the acting U.S. Capitol Police chief, to, uh, Pittman, to testify, but unfortunately the chairwoman declined and the chief declined our invitation to come so she can watch a different hearing at this time. On January 6th, acting chief Pittman was head of protective and intelligence operations and was responsible for receiving the intelligence sent to the Capitol Police about what was expected to happen that day. Judging by the fact that the rank and file members of the Capitol Police were caught unawares, and my sympathy is with all of them, I cannot help but wonder exactly what intelligence was received and what was done about it. What we know is that on January 3rd, President Trump authorized Acting Secretary of Defense Miller to activate the D.C. National Guard if requested. That fact alone indicates that some officials in our government with access to high-level intelligence knew that January 6th could be problematic. In order to find out the truth of what happened on January 6th, those in charge of the Capitol Police must testify to what they knew and be held accountable. Uh, Director Ray, I have several questions for you and I'm going to ask you please to answer very quickly and with one word which will suffice in most cases. I applaud your commitment to bringing those who incited and engaged in violence on January 6th to justice. You've stated before that you expect more serious charges against people involved in the events of January 6th. Are those charges likely to include conspiracy? Yes or no? Yes. In your legal opinion, if someone were to be charged with conspiracy to commit a crime, are they likely also to be charged with incitement? Yes or no? Uh, I'm not sure I can give you a yes or no on that one because it depends a lot on the circumstances. Then I'll ask for a written statement after the hearing. In your legal opinion, if individuals are charged with conspiracy to commit a crime, is it likely that an outside individual would also be charged with inciting them to commit their crimes? Well, I, I appreciate you asking for my legal opinion. I, I do want to be clear that uh, since becoming FBI director, I've actually been very pleased to hang up my lawyer hat. Okay. Um, and so I would really refer you to the Justice Department for, for legal opinions. All right. But, uh, if there's information I can provide, I'm happy to do it. Okay. Director Ray, you can't tell us anything about what communications were made in advance of January 6th between U.S. Capitol Police and the Capitol Police Board regarding the presence of National Guard troops because you wouldn't have been involved in those conversations. Isn't that true? Yes or no? The mute too, too quickly. Uh, you, you are correct. Okay. Uh, Dr. Director Ray, the FBI passed its Norfolk Intelligence Report to the Capitol Police in three different ways, correct? Yes, ma'am. Those three ways were an email to representatives on the task force, a verbal briefing at command post, and through a law enforcement portal, correct? Correct. The U.S. Capitol Police Chief's son testified he never received the Norfolk Intelligence Report. Yet, current Acting Chief Pittman, who declined to be with us today, was the head of protective and intelligence Serv operations for U.S. Capitol Police at the time. Do you know why she never passed this FBI intelligence report to Chief Sun? Yes or no? No, ma'am. General Flynn, you wouldn't be able to tell us about the internal intelligence assessments prepared by then Assistant Chief Pittman's Protective and Intelligence Operation Bureau in the weeks leading up to January 6th, would you? Congresswoman, I, I would not. All right, General Pyatt, you aren't intimately familiar with the command structure of the U.S. Capitol Police and any breakdowns in communication that might have occurred on January 6th, are you?
General Pyatt. General, you're muted. Please unmute your mic. Can you hear me now, ma'am? Yes. Yes. And I am. I am not, Congresswoman. Okay, uh, Madam Chair. I, I mean, I have one more question because of the time that's elapsed with the mute buttons being on. Director Ray, in February, the U.S. Capitol Police Union voted on the confidence they had in Acting Chief Pittman. Do you know what the results of that vote were? I do not. Well, I'll tell you. 92% of the Capitol Police had a vote of no confidence in Acting Chief Pittman. 92%. If my majority counterparts wanted these answers, they could have them. They could have invited Acting Chief Pittman immediately after the last hearing. They could have subpoenaed her testimony here today. I th I'm concerned that they don't want answers. They want only a political cudgel. I know the chairwoman has said she's invited the Capitol Police leadership to appear at one of these hearings and conduct oversight on what happened and what they're doing to secure the Capitol going forward, and I look forward to that. With that, Madam Chair, I yield back. The gentle lady yields back, and we do have a date for, for, for acting uh, Chief uh, Pittman, and it's July 21st, so we can get the answers to your questions then. Madam Chair, I'm, I forgot. I would like to enter a re timeline of events and approval authorities so into granted. the record. So Thank granted. you. The gentlewoman from the District of Columbia, Ms. Norton, is recognized. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. And, and my first question is for General Flynn. Uh, we know, uh, General Flynn, Flynn, that the loss of lives and, and property uh, could have been avoided, at least some of it, if the D.C. National Guard had been called out early enough to do its jobs. But until the, the district attains a statehood, and we're close on that, uh, but even the territories uh, can call out their National Guard, but the District of Columbia uh, cannot. Now, look at the convoluted process that's in place. The D.C. National Guard reports to the Secretary of Army, who in turn <laughs> supports, reports to the Secretary of Defense, who then reports to the Commander-in-Chief. If you understand that chain of command, you'll understand why there was not help earlier on January 6th. General Flynn, Flynn it, 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 is what I describe the correct description of the chain of command? Congresswoman, it is, as I understand the authorities, yes. Now, there are multiple layers of bureaucracy and, and, and red tape uh, that had real-life consequences on January 16th. And we've we got some of these documents here. I've looked at them. Uh, we've gotten them from the U.S. Capitol Police. And we've gotten them from the D.C. Police. And we know that city officials here in the District of Columbia pleaded for help. I think the, chairman, the chairwoman said 12 times before finally the acting secretary, and remember, you got to go to him to get the D.C. National Guard to begin to do its job. Uh, and just after 4.30, uh, they came, but the mayor of the District of Columbia had called the secretary of the Army at 1.34. So you've got uh, almost four hours. But we need to thank the men and women of the D.C. Police Department because they had already answered the call for help and they had begun arriving at the Capitol even 30 minutes earlier. The, D the D.C. National Guard didn't get any authority to arrive at the Capitol until four hours after the call for help. And so, Madam Chair, that, that's, 
what has led in, what in part has led to the loss of life and the confusion uh, that resulted from the insurrection. Uh, General uh, Pyatt, uh, I noted in your written testimony uh, that you have provided, and I'm going to quote from it, you said, I was definitely concerned about the public perception of using soldiers to secure the election process in any manner that could be viewed as political, end quote. General Pyatt, do you believe that the current D.C. Uh, National Guard change, chain of command to the President through the Secretary of Defense, of course appointed by the President, to the Secretary of Army appointed by the President, could inadvertently politicize and complicate the use of the D.C. Na National Guard? Madam, I believe the complication comes from the lack of unity of command and unity of effort. What we saw after January 6, when we prepared for the inauguration, was an integrated security plan across the district with one lead federal agency so that one request could be worked out immediately with that agency and they had the authorities to move and maneuver forces to wherever they would be needed. I see my time has expired. Gentle lady yields back. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Heiss, is now rec recognized. Mr. Heiss. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, along with many others, have consistently and forcefully condemned political violence by anyone, any kind, whether it happens here in the United States Capitol or anywhere else across our country. Uh, law and order is critical for us to preserve a peaceful republic, and anyone breaking our laws should be held accountable. This is what we refer to as equal justice for all. Beginning under President Trump, the FBI and the Department of Justice worked hard, tirelessly, to investigate and prosecute those who were involved in criminal behavior and violence here at the Capitol on January 6, as well they should have. But I'm troubled that reportedly dozens of individuals from the January 6 uh, riots have been held without bond in solitary confinement for up to 23 hours a day. Uh, even Senator Elizabeth Warren has said that solitary confinement is a for form of punishment that is cruel and psychologically damaging. She went on and said that in relation to those involved in January 6, that we're talking about people who haven't been convicted of anything yet. Even the ACLU expressed similar concerns, saying that solitary confinement is torture. Director Ray, you have mentioned a couple of times now some 500 plus prosecutions from January 6. Uh, your work in that regard we all appreciate. Uh, I'm, I'm curious though, how many of those are in solitary confinement? Congressman, I, I thank you for your appreciation for our work. I don't know the number that would be uh, held under those conditions. That's a, a decision made by the court uh, in conjunction with the Justice Department prosecutors. Uh, so I'm afraid I don't, I don't have that number or estimate for you. So you have no idea how many are in solitary confinement. This is something that's being pretty well reported. I would think you would have some degree of knowledge and information. You're saying you don't know. I, I don't. I don't keep up on the the terms of confinement uh, or detention. It, is is it, would you determined. consider it standard operating procedure f to hold Americans who have yet to stand trial to be held in solitary confinement? I'm not sure. I could say one way or the other on that. I'd, certainly, there are plenty of situations where that uh, that occurs. Uh, so it would have to depend on the circumstances of the particular case. And I do want to be very careful not to be commenting. Well, there's a great deal of concern with this. Let me move on. I, I started by uh, early talking about equal justice for all. Last summer, our nation was rocked by months of violence uh, all across our country following the death of George Floyd. Uh, in fact, from May 26 to June 8 last year, 
Black Lives Matter and Antifa riots caused over $2 billion in property damage. It's estimated here at the Capitol, it was on January 6th, somewhere in the neighborhood of $1.5 million. Uh, the major cities chiefs association said that during the 10 weeks following George Floyd's death, there were 574 riots, declared riots, with violence and other criminal activity. That's 57 per week. Americans lost their lives. There were, there were severe injuries, including over 2,000 law enforcement. Uh, and yet the Democratic Party to this day has yet to even hold a single hearing on the BLM and Antifa riots. It's stunning to me. Many of my Democratic colleagues pretend that the chaos never happened. Uh, others promoted, actually, and encouraged it. Uh, and, and frankly, the uh, left, along with the allies of the liberal media, pushed a false narrative that these were somehow peaceful protests. While we watched burned police stations, besieged courthouses, looted businesses, assaulted police officers, and on and on and on. And I'm, I'm concerned, Director Ray, that we are, uh, all that somehow is resulting in a less than aggressive investigation, prosecu uh, prosecution, and sentencing on the federal level. So I'm curious, how, how many individuals has the FBI investigated and or arrested uh, regarding the riots that we all watched across our country last summer? I can't give you the exact number, but I do know that we've had hundreds of investigations uh, and hundreds of arrests. And I would be remiss if I didn't say that I share your concern about the violence and criminality that occurred over the summer. Uh, it was extremely serious activity. We used all the tools in our toolbox to pursue our joint terrorism task forces, treating it as a form of domestic terrorism as well. Uh, and in fact, last year, we had more anarchist violent extremist arrests than we'd had in the prior three years combined. So we at the FBI are taking uh, both forms of domestic terrorism extremely seriously, and I appreciate your interest. Are you aware of any of those individuals being in solitary confinement? Uh, well, again, I, I, same answer as in connection with the January 6th arrest. I just All right, don't, Director Ray, I, thank I, you. I get, I get the point. I'd love to ask about the Durham report, the uh, Hunter Biden laptop, uh, Hunter's business dealings in China, and a host of other things. Uh, but my time has expired. I will wrap up. But I would urge this Democratic leadership to hold hearings on the riots that took place across this country last summer. I yield back. The gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch, is recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'd like to thank all the witnesses. Thank you for your service. Uh, I would actually not want to know about Hunter Biden's laptop. I'd like to know about the attacks on, on January 6th, if we could. And uh, Lieutenant Pyatt and General Flynn, uh, again, thank you for appearing today. Uh, Lieutenant Pyatt, in your written testimony, you stated that, quote, it was important for the D.C. National Guard to figure out the basics of their new mission. But Major General William Walker has testified that, that his forces were ready to go well before he finally received acting Secretary Miller's authorization to deploy to the Capitol. Lieutenant General Pyatt and General Flynn, our committee has obtained evidence that you both recommended that the National Guard deploy to protect other federal buildings, other federal buildings and locations in Washington, D.C., to help relieve civilian police and security forces so they could go and defend the Capitol. Is that correct? Congressman. We received the, res the first request on one, 1 January, and we spent those days preparing the D.C. National Guard to support Mayor Bowser's request for unarmed traffic control points and crowd control. When the call came in, and it was after 14 or 2.22 that afternoon, the urgent request now was to support the Capitol. That was the change of mission. The approval whoa, whoa, to support... Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let me, let me just back. I'm reclaiming my time. On January 4th, 2021, at the direction of then Sergeant Ob's Michael Stenger and then U.S. Capitol Police Chief Stun, they contacted General Walker to find out 
how many National Guard he could provide and how fast could he provide them if they were needed at the Capitol on January 6th. So we're, we're talking about an urgent need for the National Guard, D.C. National Guard, on the Capitol, not, not other buildings. And so I go, I go back uh, to the apparent decision by yourself and, and General Flynn to deploy National Guard not to the Capitol, but to other federal buildings around D.C. And, and other monuments. Is that, is that what happened here? Congressman, on the third and fourth, both the Department of Defense and the Department of the Army asked Capitol Police if they needed additional support, and both times the answer we were told they were not. What happened at the urgent request for now forces to come to the Capitol is we knew we would have to remission them because they did not have their riot control gear with them. We had to get them back to the armory. We had to reconfigure them and re-equip them to get them forward. Okay. On the phone call, what I suggested was, is we were looking at a range of options. Is there anything we could do immediately in the current posture we would in that would then help relieve others to get to the Capitol? There, were, there was not, and we but, moved on from all that. All right, so let's go to on. January 6th. This is January 6th at 420. Lieutenant Pyatt, you reportedly told Major General Walker that the National Guard should, quote, plan and prepare to transition from traffic control points and be placed around other federal buildings and monuments. This is oh, when it was Congress. hitting the fan at, at the Capitol, at, 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 at D.C., you know, at, at the Capitol complex. The, the Capitol was at, say, under I, I, attack, and you were deploying or recommending that Walker employ, General Walker deploy people to, to other, other buildings. And I just, I can't reconcile that given the threat that, that we were under. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm just curious, at that moment, what, what were you thinking? Uh, what, were, what, was your, what was your reasoning? Congressman, I'm sorry, Congressman. Go ahead. I'm Congressman, the, I, I do not know where that report came from. I, I deny that. At, at 4.30 that afternoon, we were minutes away from getting an approved plan from Sec Secretary McCarthy. We had approval at 3 o'clock to use the guard. We had at 304, we had approval for full mobilization of the DC National Guard. What we needed was a new mission. And that new mission is what took time. There was no other seeking approval. But we needed but, to redeploy but look, look, forces look, and look, let me just them. on the chronology, uh, it your your recollection does not match what the record says. So the the, the 420 call was 80 minutes after Secretary Miller determined that all available forces of the DC National Guard are required to reinforce D.C. police and U.S. Capitol Police positions. So it, it almost seems like we're deploying the National Guard or recommending their deployment away from the Capitol. And I, I just, I haven't got a good answer on that, and I'm not getting one today. Congressman, I, I would recommend, I would refer to the U.S. Army Report of Operations on 6 January <laughs> that we submitted to this committee. The timeline was that we had approval at 3 o'clock after the 2.30 phone call. We had approval to mobilize at, at 3.04. Then we needed to have a plan which required the redeployment of the Guard, reconfiguration, re-equipment, now to go into a mission that they were not previously conducting. They were conducting an unarmed traffic control point. That was the time we needed, and we recalled people from their civilian workforce. What the D.C. National Guard did in those short hours was extraordinary. Now, when people's lives are on the line, two, two minutes is too long. But we were not positioned to respond to that urgent request. We had to re-prepare so we would send them in prepared for this now, this new mission. Madam Chair, my time is expired. Thank you, General. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Grothman, is now recognized. Mr. Thank you. Um, a few questions for all of you. Um, and I don't know if you know the answers or not, but these are, I think, the type of questions that people back home are concerned about. Um, how many people were in the Capitol that day? I mean, members of the public. How many, how many got in? Does anybody know the answer to that question? And it's, it's Director Ray. I, I don't know that we have the, uh, uh, a reliable estimate, but certainly we've already arrested uh, close to 500. 
uh, and we have hundreds of investigations uh, that are still ongoing beyond those okay. 500. I, I know Senator Johnson got a limited amount of video, and he's having his staff try to figure that out. I mean, we're about five months after this took place. We still don't know how many people are in the Capitol. You can't just give me that 1,100, 800. We don't know, huh? We don't know. Okay. Of those people in the Capitol, well, I am under the impression that day that there are people who clearly horrifically did, did wrong things. We saw them on the video. They broke the windows. They, uh, they broke in. But we also remember seeing people on TV that day who were almost led in the Capitol. Um, could you break down, give me numbers broken down in those two areas, the number who broke their way into the Capitol and the number that appeared to almost be escorted in by the Capitol Police? Uh, I'm not sure I could give you reliable numbers on that sitting here right now, but I, maybe let me try it this way. Um, when we look, when we step back and we look at January 6th as a whole, you have one group of people who didn't uh, reach the Capitol, didn't enter unlawfully into the Capitol, didn't commit acts, who were sort of peaceful, rowdy protesters. Those are not people that we are pursuing. And there's a second group, smaller, uh, but still very sizable, who were uh, in the moment, engaged in all sorts of criminal behavior uh, of the sort that you're describing. And those people are being prosecuted for a variety of offenses. And then there's a third group, which while the smallest, is by far and away the most serious. Uh, and those are the people who were clearly coming with intent to commit very serious mayhem, who brought all sorts of uh, weapons and protective gear and other things with them. Uh, and those are the people who face the most serious charges. And so I sort of look at it as a kind of inverse pyramid with the most serious people being the smallest group, but all of them are, it's a sizable number, obviously. We've already indicted 30 something for conspiracy yeah. charges alone. And uh, as I, I said, I, I want to focus a little bit on the people who didn't do any physical damage, didn't engage in any physical contact with the police, and at least appeared to me that day to be allowed in the Capitol? Are there people like that? Like that who were, who were in the Capitol? Correct. As I recall watching TV that day, there were people who, it appeared, were walking in the door, and it appeared as though the Capitol Police, perhaps out of exhaustion for whatever motivation, allowed people to walk in the Capitol. Are there people like that? Well, I, I, you know, at any given moment, you might have somebody uh, uh, caught on a particular stretch of video walking along in a way that's unremarkable. I really can't speak in a broad categorical way about, about intent well, of individual people. back home are concerned about a certain class of person. I want to know whether you feel these people existed. Were there people allowed in the Capitol who didn't engage in any physical confrontation or do any damage? And it, and, and just wound up in the Capitol, breaking the law, but they would have no idea, way of knowing they're breaking the law. Were there people like that? I, I really can't give you an assessment of that at this stage. That's why we're investigating, and that sometimes investigations lead to charges, and sometimes they don't. Have you arrested? Would... I, you, you talked about all the 500 people or whatever have been arrested. Are any of those people you arrested, would they be included in the type of people I just described? I really can't say. What I would say is that people who uh, have been arrested have been arrested because they violated federal criminal law and there were sufficient facts to support the elements oh, of the offense. Okay, the prosecutors I, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time. Beyond a reasonable doubt. Yeah, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to ask you one more question. Were people arrested who walked in the Capitol, had perhaps had no reason to know they were breaking the law, and were, as one Capitol policeman described it to me, just milling around? Were people like that arrested, and are they still in jail? I can't speak to any specific case, so I'm really not sure that well, I can even answer one. the question. We've had, 500, we've had 500 arrests, and they range in all sorts of variations in facts and circumstances.
The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Conley, is now recognized. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And Mr. Ray, thank you for those 500 arrests, and I hope there are 500 more. I hope everyone who participated in this outrage is held to account and brought to justice. I might also say, Madam Chairwoman, listening to our colleagues on the other side of the aisle, reminds me of the musical of Chicago, where Richard Gere says, when you can't win an argument, razzle-dazzle. Distract them. Do the shuffle. Talk about Fauci. Talk about mass. Talk about anything but a violent insurrection that cost seven lives. Five here and two suicides. Because two cops internalized the failure that occurred in January 6 on themselves. Ignoring that, distracting it, denying it, gaslighting it, calling it just a bunch of tourists who get a little carried away is repugnant and a dishonor to the memories of those who did die and a dishonor and disrespect to those who were willing to put themselves at risk on our behalf and more importantly on that of the Republic for which we stand. Mr. Ray, Director Ray, um, January 5th, the field office in Norfolk issued an intelligence report warning of online threats discussing specific calls for violence against Congress the next day on January 6th. Words like be ready to fight, get violent, get ready for war. It also stated we get our president or we die Nothing else will achieve this goal. According to previous congressional testimony you've given, this report was shared in an email with other law enforcement agencies. But for some reason, the report did not make it to the high-level officials who needed to see it, despite its alarming content. Is it true that you did not see this report until after the 6th? Uh, Congressman, I think the report you're referring to is not an intelligence report, but what's, what we refer to as a situational information it, it, it was a It was a report from your field office in Norfolk, I believe. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yes, our so, Norfolk. Field but even so, it's pretty alarming. Absolutely. Uh, now, it's raw, unverified information not attributed to a specific individual but, online. But, how, but, but I would say it was alarming enough. It was alarming enough that we took steps to share it, not one, not two, but three different ways with our partners here in the National Capital Region. One was with an email to their representatives on our Joint Terrorism Task Force, who are there precisely to be their eyes and ears. So everybody makes sure we have the same information. So, Second, it was briefed orally, orally to the members of the Joint Terrorism Task Force, including members of the Capitol Police, who again were there. And then third, on our law enforcement portal, which exists for the very purpose to share information with our partners about potential threat information. Did anyone alert the Capitol Hill Police Chief at the time, Stephen Sund, to the existence of this very alarming field report? I'm not aware of whether he was alerted by anybody in his own department uh, or el elsewhere, but certainly it was shared with the Capitol Police. But you are aware of the fact that that police chief, former police chief, in fact, has testified he was not made aware of it before the 6th. I I'm not sure that I'm completely up on what uh, former Chief Sun has, has or has not testified. Okay. I really wouldn't want to care. Was the se Senate Sergeant at Arms, Michael Stenger, or the House counterpart, Paul Irving, made aware of this report prior to January 6th? I don't know the answer to that. Would you agree that if they weren't, and they both testify, they all testified they weren't, that in retrospect, they should have been, and that that field report should have been elevated to the highest level of concern, given what was happening here in the Capitol, and given the words that were being used, and the high internet traffic, in which the phrase, storm the Capitol, in fact, frequently occurred? 
You know, Congressman, it's hard for me to evaluate with the lens of 2020 hindsight how each of them should, should run their departments. I, I do think that we tried very hard to, using the established processes to get the information to the partners who need to have it. Uh, and like I said, not leaving it to chance, not one, not two, but three different ways. Uh, but certainly we're going to be looking hard on our end to figure out are there better ways for us to share information beyond the ways that we have been doing it uh, as we go forward. I wish I had more time to explore that with you. I hope somebody will. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan, is now recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. The previous uh, speaker from Virginia just said, uh, talk about anything but. That's exactly what the Democrats are doing. That's exactly what they're doing. They don't want to talk about the crisis at the border. We've yet to have a hearing in this committee, the Government Oversight Committee, about the crisis at the border. They don't want to talk about the, the, the huge increase in crime because Democrats all over this country and, and municipals uh, and, and cities are defunding the police. They don't want to talk about inflation, the increased price of gas. They don't want to talk about the fact that every single employer I talk to in our district, I bet it's the same in yours, can't find people to work because when you pay people not to work, you shouldn't be surprised when you don't have workers. They don't want to talk about their, their, their bill that they introduced in the Judiciary Committee to pack the court. They don't want to talk about the fact they're going to raise taxes, they're going to ban firearms, and they're getting ready to hire more agents at the IRS to harass American citizens. We saw it just a week ago when tax returns against the law were leaked to the press. They don't want to talk about They want another Trump investigation. Here's what, this, here's what the chairwoman said in her opening statement just this morning. The committee released documents we obtained showing that the weeks leading up to the January 6th attack, President Trump repeatedly pressured the Department of Justice. Pressured the Department of Justice, they say. And in their press release, they say the White House Chief of Staff, uh, Chief of Staff pressured DOJ. Let's look at what the White House Chief of Staff said. He sent an email to Mr. Rosen, the Acting Attorney General. Can you have your team look into these allegations of wrongdoing? Wow. A lot of pressure there. Wants them to look into something. Every chief of staff, I bet, for every single one of us sends the same kind of emails and letters every day. You get constituents, you get people call you, you send it to the agency. Can you look into this? Let's see what else Mr. Meadows had to say. Send a YouTube link. Imagine, I, I bet we've had some of our chiefs of staff send YouTube links to colleagues and to people in agency. I, wow, that's pressure in the deep. How about this one? There have been allegations about signature match anomalies in Fulton County, Georgia. Can you get Jeff Clark to engage on this issue immediately if there's any truth to this allegation? Boy, that's a lot of pressure there. Mark Meadows putting a lot of pressure on people, asking, can you look into this allegation? Someone's raised it. After all, lots of Americans, 80, 90 million Americans had concerns with the election. But what are the Democrats doing? They're going to launch another investigation, call in five people for depositions. But we can't have the head of the Capitol Hill police here today like we wanted. Oh, it's interesting, too, the response that the attorney general gave to Mr. Meadows when he sent that email. I think this is interesting. He says, I can't believe this. I'm not going to respond to the message below. Wow. Wow. That's, that's a, that is a problem. When the president, when the chief of staff to the president of the United States asks someone in the executive branch to do something and they basically give him the finger... I think that's the problem we should be looking into, but that's not what the Democrats are going to look into. No, nope, they got another investigation. We can't, we can't talk about the border crisis here. Can't have, we hadn't had one hearing in this room about that. Can't do that. They want to investigate Trump again, even though the Obama Department of Justice spied on President Trump's campaign, lied to the FISA court 68 times, not Jim Jordan. That's, that's Inspector General Horowitz, 68 times in the Carter Page FISA alone. We can't look into those issues. We're going to do another investigation about pressuring people by sending emails to the Justice Department. Somehow that's now pressuring. So uh, I, I appreciate our witnesses coming here today. But when the, when the chairwoman raised that in her opening statement, sends out a big press release saying they're going to do this, it just, again, underscores that this committee is not doing what it should do. I'll say it again. The fact that we have yet to have a hearing on a situation on our southern border where for not one month, not two months, but three months in a row, we've set record numbers of illegal immigrants coming into this nation, and we can't have a hearing in this committee. But we're going to investigate Mark Meadows sending an email to the Justice Department saying, hey, there's been allegations raised. Can you check it out? Wow. Wow. 
The taxpayers are going to love the work that we're going to do with this. They're going to love it. This, this is ridiculous. What, what, what the Democrats pretend to be the work of Congress now is ridiculous. New investigation about Mark Meadows asking someone to look into. I yield back. It's enough. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Krishnamurthy, is now recognized. Director Ray, when we last spoke on April 15th at a House Intelligence Committee hearing, you testified the as the following, quote, I think there have been some instances where you have non-state actors who have offered different kinds of support to domestic violent extremists here in this country. You continue to believe that, right, Mr. Ray? Uh, yes, my testimony from the, our prior exchange uh, remains the same. Yes, sir. And the FBI has been investigating this issue of the foreign funding of domestic violent extremists, correct? Uh, well, foreign funding, um, certainly, certainly different kinds of interaction. I'm not sure that I could specify funding sitting here right now, but we are very focused on the interplay between different types of, as you said, non-state actors overseas and domestic terrorists here in the United States. On January 14th, Yahoo News highlighted a report on the issue of DVE funding from a company called Chainalysis. According to this report, one month before January 6th, a French donor, quote, lamenting the decline of Western civilization, close quote, sent approximately a quarter million dollars in Bitcoin to an individual named Nick Fuentes. Why Nick Fuentes? Nick Fuentes, who's been suspended from YouTube for hate speech, is the self-proclaimed leader of the group Groypers, a white supremacist group opposed to immigration and minorities. The Anti-Defamation League confirmed that many of Groypers' members were at the Capitol on January 6th, including Nick Fuentes himself. Here's a picture of Mr. Fuentes from his Twitter account on that day. The circle is around Mr. Fuentes himself. ProPublica documents that members of Groypers breached the Capitol that day as well. Mr. Ray, here's what we know. A foreign actor sent a quarter million dollars in Bitcoin to the leader, Nick Fuentes, of a far-right extremist group, Groypers, in the lead up to January 6. We also know from NBC News from January 16th, reporting that the FBI is investigating this particular transaction involving Nick Fuentes. Sir, you can't rule out that other far-right extremist groups receive foreign donations in the lead-up to January 6, can you? Uh, not only would I not want to rule it out, but certainly the possibility of foreign funding or support for domestic violent extremism is something that's particularly high on our priority list because of the challenges it poses. You and you can't, you can't rule that's out... part of the concern. Yes, sir. You can't rule out that foreign financing helped fund activities related to January 6, right? Uh, correct. I'm not sure we've seen that at this stage, but I certainly wouldn't purport to have ruled it out. Okay. That's very disturbing that foreign uh, actors may have helped fund activities connected to the January 6 insurrection. Uh, I want to turn your attention to another topic. Director Ray, you became the FBI director in 2017, right? In uh, August of 2017. We recently learned from Al Apple Corporation that in early 2018, the company received a subpoena, including a, fe a federal gag order, requesting electronic metadata related to House Intelligence Committee members, staffers, and family members. This is in connection with a, D a DOJ leak investigation. You've heard about this investigation and these subpoenas, correct? I I've been reading about them in the press, yes. Well, CNN reports, quote, the leak hunt began when the FBI sent a subpoena to Apple in February 2018. You don't dispute that report, correct? Uh, I really can't discuss a specific investigation. Uh, I really don't want to get out in front of the Justice Department on this. You know, and, decisions about subpoenas are really best directed. Towards and the FBI interviewed witnesses in connection with this leak investigation, correct? Again, sir, I really can't discuss any specific investigation. I'm not asking you to discuss any specifics of the investigation, but the FBI was involved with these investigations, correct? 
when there are leak investigations, uh, typically the FBI is the investigative agency. Good. That's, correct. that's that, the really that's what we thought. The FBI was involved with this investigation. Now, sir, and this is during the time that you are the FBI director. Did you ever discuss the Apple subpoenas with Jeff Sessions? Uh, Congressman, I understand the question. I really don't want to get out of the Justice Department on this. As you know, the Attorney Sir, General... Sir, you're just being asked a simple yes or no question. Did you discuss the leak investigation with Jeff Sessions? Uh, Congressman, again, respectfully, I'm not trying to be difficult here, but the Inspector General has been asked to look into this. I have a very good work Sir, you're being evasive. The These are yes or no Attorney questions, General. sir. You're under oath. These are yes or no simple questions that we need to get to the bottom of. Sir, serving these secret subpoenas um, to collect records on members of Congress is something we'd expect in Putin's Russia, not the United States. And sir, your involvement needs to be probed just like everyone else's. Thank you. Time has expired. Um, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Sessions, is recognized for five minutes. Chairwoman, thank you very much, and I want to thank each of the witnesses that uh, chose to appear today. I'm disturbed that the uh, acting chief of the U.S. Capitol Hill Police, uh, who was in charge of uh, intelligence, did not show today. Director Ray, thank you very much for uh, agreeing to come and be a part of this hearing. Thank you for the professionalism that the Federal Bureau of Investigation uh, has been a part of, as well as the United States Army and the men and women uh, that were under the command of General Flynn uh, and uh, Walker Pat too, and we thank you. I'd like to, if I can, take just a second with uh, Director Ray, and without being very specific, I believe that you would be well into what might be called the management of this long investigation. This is one of the largest investigations in the history of this country. Is that correct, sir? Certainly, it's one of the most uh, far-reaching uh, and extensive that I can think of. During my history of watching the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI would like to get it right, and they will take their time and not try and uh, cut a corner or shirk a task. Do you believe that's still true about the Federal Bureau of Investigation? Yes, sir. I believe very strongly in my message to our folks since the day I arrived and continuing ever since is that we need to make sure that we don't just do the right thing, that we do it in the right way, and that the FBI's brand, if you will, is based in, in large part on the way we do our work, which is painstakingly, professionally, and objectively. Uh, and that's what I expect of all 37,000 men and women of the FBI. Do you believe that you would come under political pressure from leading Democrats in this committee who want you to arrest 500 more people, that you would think that you should go out and do that as a result of political pressure being placed on you by senior Democrats of this committee? Uh, Congressman, I don't, I don't feel any pressure. Uh, from uh, any members of, of either political party. My intention is for us to uh, investigate professionally, objectively, with proper predication, following the facts under the law, uh, wherever they may lead, no matter who likes it. Mr. Ray, I believe that what you've said to me, I believe is true and correct, and that is the Federal Bureau of Investigation would not feel that they were under political pressure by senior Democrats to have you do something that, in fact, the Bureau knew might not be correct. So I will answer that for you. I think you answered that way. Do you believe that you would be uh, well within your ideas to say that this may take a little bit longer and there will need to be trials and the trials will develop the facts of the case and as people uh, have their opportunity to be a part of a trial, that they will either plead guilty or be found guilty, and that that will be the point at which we would then know the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, sir. I would like to ask you um, if you believe that this would really be the story that would be told as opposed to ahead of time trying to place you and other members of, uh, that work for the federal government in a diminished role at this time without knowing the full answer. 
I'm sure you've got questions in your mind. Do you believe that it will help you put together a better story when you actually know based upon the outcome of trials? Well, absolutely. I've always, even when I was a line prosecutor, felt like I learned, uh, I can't think of a trial I had where I didn't learn important things during the trial, even after a long, very meticulous investigation. And I would expect that to be true in the 500 or so cases uh, that are at issue here. Well, Mr. Ray, I, I want you to know that I believe that we are involved in a crisis in this country. We've been through one. I think January 6th was a, a, a very difficult time and a crisis. Uh, do you believe that you've learned some lessons? You do not need to go into them, but that you will be able to help local law enforcement as well as uh, Capitol Hill Police so that you can give them, uh, before we get the after action report, give them information that would secure our country better today moving forward? I believe we've already learned some valuable lessons and I expect we will continue to learn more and we view the Capitol Police as terrific partners uh, who have a very tough job to do and we look forward to working with them. Mr. Ray, I want to thank you and I hope that you would know that every single member of this committee would hope, and wish and pray that the lessons that are learned you will be able to, be able to bring to bear to not only support uh, the American people, but also the members of law enforcement to help them be better. And, sir, I want to thank you for your time today, and may God bless you. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Raskin, is now recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks to the witnesses for their service and the testimony. In an emergency, every minute matters. Vice President Pence escaped right-wing insurrectionists chanting, hang Mike Pence, hang Mike Pence by one minute on January the 6th. The order to deploy the National Guard to the Capitol did not come until nearly two and a half hours after the Capitol was first breached. That was at 4.32 p.m. on January 6th when Acting Defense Secretary Miller gave verbal authorization for the D.C. Guard to deploy to the Capitol. Yet Major General William Walker, the commanding general of the D.C. National Guard, on January the 6th has testified he was not informed of this authorization until 5.08 p.m., fully 36 minutes later. As a result, the D.C. Guard did not arrive at the Capitol until 5.20 p.m., almost an hour after the initial green light was given. Lieutenant, Lieutenant General Pyatt, how do you account for this 36-minute delay in transmitting the order for National Guard troops to move to the Capitol? Congressman, Secretary McCarthy, our records show that he called at 435 after receiving that approval at 432. There are discrepancies in the log and all the timelines as we merged all the reports. I can only account for that the troops were going through their final stages of boarding buses and getting ready to go. But what they did was really a, a Herculean effort to remission in that amount of time and be prepared to now go to meet a whole new mission of riot control at the Capitol. Okay, yeah, but I'm not talking about the troops here. I'm talking about the 36-minute delay between uh, when Walker received authorization and when the authorization originally came down. Well, let me let me put it this way: um, the, the documents received by the committee uh, suggest it's unclear who finally told Major General Walker that he had approval to send the guard to the Capitol or when that occurred. According to one document obtained by the committee, Army Secretary McCarthy personally notified Major General Walker at 4.35 p.m. that he was authorized to deploy. But according to the D.C. Guard's own timeline, this directive was relayed to Walker by Army Chief of Staff General James McConville. So, General Flynn, whose job was it to inform Major General Walker that he could deploy the Guard to the Capitol? Congressman, by authority, it would have been the Secretary of the Army. Well, how do you explain the discrepancies in these accounts from the Pentagon and the D.C. National Guard? Congressman, I, I cannot explain those discrepancies in the timelines. I think as uh, various timelines got merged, uh, there's minutes off. Well, do you, how do you explain that 36 minute delay? 
Congressman, I can't explain that. What I do know in our timeline is that 1702, the buses began to deploy to the Capitol. That's when the movement started. Okay, so th that would have been 30 minutes after uh, the acting Defense Secretary Miller gave the verbal instruction. Do you think that that 32 minute delay is uh, justifiable or acceptable in terms of getting the DC National Guard to the United States Capitol during the most serious uh, siege and attack since the War of 1812? Congressman, I would say that uh, the buses leaving at 1702 uh, and organizing those soldiers on that uh, transportation in changed mission from being merely in crowd control and going from an unarmed force in a non-law enforcement mode to something very different and being put into the middle of a violent mob. Um, I think that that... Uh, accounts for that time, Congressman. General, you closed your testimony by saying, we must address the circumstances that allowed this to happen. What circumstances are you referring to there? The circumstances I'm referring to, Congressman, is when I look back at what happened here, there's four things in planning that we could have done and we should have done. Uh, the first one, there should have been a clearly a lead federal agency designated. The second one is we should have had an integrated security plan. The third one is, and much of this has been talked about already, is uh, information and intelligence sharing on criminal activities before the 6th of January. And then the fourth one would, would have been, we should have uh, pre-federalized certain National Guard forces so that they could have immediately been moved to the Capitol and had those authorities in place before this happened. Okay, well, I see my time is up. Thank you for your testimony, gentlemen, and I yield back, Madam Chair. The gentleman uh, yields back. My colleagues' uh, votes have been called on the floor, but we're going to keep the hearing going to ensure that all members have an opportunity to ask questions. So members are encouraged to ask questions during the votes series, if possible, we can stagger that and just keep the hearing going. I now recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Gibbs. You are now, now you. recognized. Thank, thank Mr. you, Mayor Gibbs. Chairwoman. Uh, Dr. Ray, uh, you know, with all the chatter, I think it was going around on social media and the internet previous uh, days uh, to January 6th, uh, were you aware there was chatter out there, Director Ray? Uh, there was a variety of, of social media chatter, yes, sir. And, and then also your Norfolk report, it just, uh, that it's just like an unbelievable intelligence failure, it seems like. And it's inconceivable to me that there wasn't briefings with leadership in here in the, in the Congress and, and law enforcement. Uh, as director of the FBI, you should be examining that, why that breakdown, and so that never happens again. Uh, has there been any arrests made on the people, persons that uh, uh, did the pipe bombs at uh, RNC and DNC headquarters? Uh, no, we have not made arrests on that. We are aggressively investigating. We recently, you may have seen, put out additional uh, higher quality photos in an effort to see if we could get uh, better information from the public on it. Uh, that's one of the investigations that uh, we're particularly concerned about. Uh, the, the 500 people that have been arrested uh, January 6th, um, do the uh, charges, they range from uh, trespassing, disorderly conduct, um, uh, assault, um, insurrection, or, or what, what are the ch charges? Uh, well, there are a variety of charges. I would probably better off to refer you to the Justice Department for the full list, uh, but certainly they have ranged from uh, assaults on federal officers uh, to different kinds of obstruction offenses. We've had some conspiracy charges. Uh, I'm not sure I could give you a, a but it, real it, was full it, catalog. Is, has there been any insurrection charges? Uh, I don't believe so. But again, there have been close to 500 and, cases. And you know, uh, but I don't believe so. have, have been uh, people been on, held in jail since January or since their arrest uh, on trespassing charges or minor charges? Are still are they held in jail without due process? I don't believe anybody's been denied due process, sir. Okay. I'm going to change the subject here a little bit. Um, 
uh, uh, you know, we've got this big issue with what happened with the COVID, uh, the origins and the intelligence. And it was recently reported that three researchers at the Wuhan Institute of Virology became sick with COVID-19 like symptoms in November 2019 and sought hospital care for their illnesses. Are you aware, are you aware of any additional intelligence showing that COVID-19 pandemic was not the result of transmission from an animal to, to a human, but instead was a result of a leak from the Wuhan Institute of Virology? Uh, Congressman, I certainly understand, of course, the interest in the topic. Uh, as you may have seen, the intelligence community is doing a deep dive on the subject uh, and has not reached a definitive conclusion. Uh, and what there is that we're looking at um, is, of course, heavily interwoven with classified information. So I'm not really sure there's a whole lot I can say right now uh, at this point, but obviously we are working very hard and have a lot of people across the intelligence community working on it. But you're not saying there, there could be intelligence to that. Okay. Uh, what's the FBI doing to investigate the origins of COVID-19? given that the Chinese government has engaged in widespread cover-up of its origins? Again, I, I can't discuss a specific investigation, as I've said, uh, in connection with other responses. Okay. But uh, as you may know, I've tried to be very vocal and intend to remain very vocal during my tenure as FBI director about the threat posed by the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese government in particular. Uh, and the FBI is actively engaged with our partners in the intelligence community on the assessment that has been called for by uh, the Director of National Intelligence and the President. Are, are you aware of any U.S. research funding to the Wuhan Institute was diverted to conduct research for the Chinese military, given that the State Department just reported that such research has been conducted there since 2017? Again, Congressman, we are dealing into all the facts and information that we have available to us as an intelligence community with the FBI as an active participant, uh, and that's really all I can say on this subject at this point. I know in, in previous questions you were asked about uh, uh, Portland and Seattle uh, riots last, uh, last summer, and uh, you couldn't tell us how many people that the FBI has arrested and convicted and what the charges were, especially when, on the siege and the on the, on the federal courthouse out there and also uh, holding uh, large areas of the, of the, of the city's um, hostage. Um, so is the FBI investigation still going on and, or has it changed since the new administration? Uh, no, we continue to investigate just as aggressively on our end uh, as before. Uh, again, I don't have exact numbers for you, but I know that last time I checked, I think we had on the FBI side, uh, or at least on the federal side, about 100 arrests in Portland alone. Um, and then there were about, I think, 800 maybe local arrests. But that, that information may have changed or uh, since my last report. Thank That's you, just sir. Portland. That's just Portland, not, not nationwide. Portland. Thank, thanks, Director Ray. I'm out of time. You go back. Madam Chair, Madam Chair, parliamentary inquiry. Yes, ma'am. How, how is it? The, the gentleman is recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. How is it a member um, expected to meaningfully participate in this very important committee hearing while we're walking uh, back and forth from the Capitol to cast votes, which are in 20 minute blocks? Those of us that do not participate in what we believe to be unconstitutional proxy voting, how does the chair expect us to participate meaningfully in this committee? while we walk back and forth from the Capitol to vote? It's a serious question. Yeah, this is not a parliamentary inquiry. We're keeping this committee hearing going while allowing members to go to vote. Uh, Elsa will be here all night. Is there some, the is there some hesitancy to, de to devote the time that's required for this very important hearing, Madam Chair? Uh, sir, we are devoting all the time that is required. Uh, but members have to vote. They need to go to vote. Which is exactly Come why back. we should adjourn. I object to that not happening, and I, I like the it on the gentleman's request is denied. The gentleman from California, Mr. Kahana, uh, is recognized was that an official for five move to minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, Did you for move to adjourn? your leadership. Uh, thank you, Director Ray, uh, for your service. Director Ray, you have told uh, House committees that you need to look hard at what happened. You are committed to doing better. Uh, you told Chairwoman Maloney that uh, you have to bat 1,000 percent, and even one mistake is unacceptable, and you will make sure this never Madam Chair, I, I move to again. adjourn.
Madam Chair, if I could uh, pause, I, I'm not sure. been a motion, it. Madam Chair. It doesn't have the floor. The gentleman is not recognized. Mr. Mr. It is Mr. Conistein. You know, Madam Chair, we had an insurrection. We don't need disruptions here. Can we allow the democratic process to continue, please? Some of our members would like to hear the complete testimony. Well, I, I think that we should follow the rules. That's the rules state problem. that if there is a motion to adjourn, that we have to have a vote immediately. Madam Chair, we have, a, we have a motion on the floor. A motion on the floor. Regular order. Regular order. The gentleman no, 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 will suspend. The regular order is there's been a motion made and we vote on the motion. Ma Madam Chair, may I continue my line of inquiry? The gentleman, Mr. Kahana, will continue. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Director Ray, you have said that you have to bat a thousand percent, that there is no room for a mistake. But Director Ray, uh, instead of speaking in generalities, you know, I mean, if there was a football coach after a losing season who gave those generalities, that wouldn't cut it with the American public. So I want to drill down on specifics. Was this an intelligence failure on the part of the FBI? Director I wouldn't describe it that way, uh, but I would say that we consider what happened on uh, January 6th to be unacceptable. We share. No, I, the I don't want the generalities, sir. I don't want the platitudes. I want the specifics of what went wrong. Like someone would say, our quarterback was, didn't throw correctly. We didn't have enough uh, defense. What are the specifics? Don't give me any platitudes. What, did the FBI have any intelligence that was actionable about what happened on January 6th? Yes or no? To my knowledge, sir, we did not have actionable intelligence that indicated that hundreds of people were going to breach so, the Capitol. So wouldn't this be an intelligence failure if you did not have actionable intelligence and if uh, the CEO of Parler knew what was going on and half of social media and half the folks per in, in, on the Internet knew what was going on? Wouldn't you describe that as an intelligence failure? Well, I, I'm not trying to quibble on terminology, sir. I, I guess what I would just say to you is that anytime there's an attack, we consider that to be uh, unacceptable, and we're determined would, to try to get you better say that sources you need to get, so do that we a can better, have more information. Would you say you need to do a better job getting intelligence on these kind of attacks? Yes, sir, I do, would say that, and in fact, I'm glad you raised that, because that's one of the things, if you want to sort of take it out of the realm of, of what you're calling platitudes, that's one of the things that we are particularly focused on is how can we develop better human sources to anticipate things like this? That's one. How can we develop better data Was there analytics? a failure? Did you have any intelligence which you failed to act on, or is it your testimony that there was no actionable intelligence? I am sitting here right now recognizing that this, as, as has already been discussed, a sprawling investigation. I am not aware of any actionable intelligence that we failed to pass on. You spoke about uh, but how, again, you, yeah. how you were uh, surprised that there were no uh, individuals who were arrested of the 500 that you had investigated. I was shocked. I, I said, how is it possible that you have 500 of these individuals who have never been investigated by the FBI? Uh, does it concern you that none of the people who were arrested were on your radar at the FBI? Uh, well, two things. One, uh, I think I said almost none, not none. You but did. Second, uh, certainly, second, certainly the investigation is ongoing, uh, and facts will develop further as we go forward. Did, did you third, have preliminary? Yes, but third, yes, yes. That is one of the things that I, I, I view as most important to us, which is we obviously had lots of very well-predicated, important investigations that we were conducting. Did you have any investigations, sir? My time is running didn't. out. I don't want to be rude, but did you have any investigations on Oath Keepers, Proud Boys, or Three Percenters? Uh, we, I know we had investigations related to individuals connected with some of those groups. I can't, sitting here right now, uh, separate in my head which investigations were before do you, January Do you think 6th, in retrospect you should have paid more attention and in intelligence to some of the white supremacists and extremist groups and that there was not sufficient intelligence done on those groups? I'm not sure I would go that far. And here, let me just tell you why. We have, during my time as director, dramatically increased, I think doubled the number of investigations that we have been conducting specifically into what we call but, racially motivated violence. But you don't think if there were all these arrests, sir, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you don't think that if there were all these arrests 
and none of them were people, or almost none were people that you had investigated, and half the Internet is talking about these folks and knows about these folks, that the FBI needs to do a better job in, in, in getting intelligence? And then let me just ask this final sure. question, which you can ask. If you knew before January 6th what the FBI knows now about the militia groups conspiring to attack the Capitol, would the government have been able to thwart this attack? Well, on the first part, I think I've been very clear consistently that I think the FBI needs to do better, and we're determined to do better. On the second part, it's hard for me to answer a hypothetical. Certainly, if we had information that we've been developing in our investigations since January 6th, before January 6th, and Director, Ray, does it make your job able. harder when some of the lawmakers in this body are praising the protesters, some even saluting with a uh, clenched fist, the protesters. Does that make the job of the FBI harder to get after uh, those who uh, harmed our democracy? Uh, I guess the best way for me to answer that is I certainly understand why you're asking the question, but I think it's best for me as FBI director to speak through our work and not to be weighing in uh, on in commentary on specific people's rhetoric. But I certainly understand why you're asking the question. I appreciate your service, sir. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Gozar, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Director Ray, I would like to start by again asking for all the surveillance footage from January 6th and the preceding days to be released to the public. I am told there are thousands of hours of footage. Now, Director Ray, yes or no, would you agree that the public has a right to know the truth and that the information and footage should be made public? information we produce has to be done in, in coordination with the well, yes, yes or no. I mean, well, I don't, sir, respectfully, I don't think it is a yes or no question. Well, okay. We have to so be very careful let me, let me, to protect the integrity of the ongoing cases. Well, and there are just I, I very let me recapture my time here. Democratic members, you just heard of Congress, have made some outlandish allegations about reconnaissance tours and even filed ethics complaints against members, including me, which was recently thrown out. Mr. Ray, would you agree, yes or no, that the video footage is often the best evidence documenting an event? Video footage is often very useful information to document events. Thank you. Director Ray, do you believe that security footage of a public building, of public officials paid for by public taxpayers, potentially containing exculpatory evidence should be provided to public defenders? Well, I think what information is provided to public defenders in criminal cases should be done under the rules of discovery, uh, which are spelled out and are more complicated than I could cover in the time that okay. we have here. Okay. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Director A, now switching points. Can you confirm that no one inside the Capitol on January 6th was arrested for carrying or using a firearm? Sir, my understanding is that there has been at least one individual who was arrested for having a firearm inside the Capitol. Um, there are, I think, a small number of other cases, local cases, uh, can you get, by that I mean. Can, you provide, arrest can you provide that information for us in written testimony, please? I, I'm happy to have my staff follow up with yours. Thank you. I appreciate that. Director Ray, can you confirm that nobody arrested for the involvement in the January 6th riot has been charged with the crime of insurrection? Uh, sir, as I, as I think I said in response to one of your colleagues, uh, sitting here right now, I don't believe there have been insurrection charges in any of the indictments so I, far. But I, again, with 500 cases, I, I want to be sure I, that I, I believe, believe you're right. Yeah, I agree. So now switching gears again. Director Ray, do you know who executed Ashley Babbitt? I, no, I don't know the name of the person okay. who. So was do you agree that Ashley, Ashley Babbitt, Babbitt was unarmed? I, I, no, I really can't weigh in on the facts and circumstances of that case. As you may know, that was investigated by the uh, D.C. Metro's Internal Affairs Department with the DOJ Civil Rights Division and the U.S. Attorney's Office, and the FBI well, was not it's, it's, it's investigative agents. Yeah, it's a disturbing. The Capitol Police officer that did the shooting actually appeared, appeared to be hiding, lying in wait, and they gave no warning before killing her. Question again, why hasn't that officer that executed Ashley Babbitt been named when police officers around the country are routinely identified after a shooting? 
comment on that case. It's not one that we've been directly involved in, so I really can't agree or disagree with your characterization. Sounds good. Do you approve of lethal force against unarmed citizens, particularly a 110-pound woman with no warning, no use of no, uh, no use of non-lethal force prior, and while laying in wait? Not going to try to answer a hypothetical, especially one based on a case that I just said. That actually said that wasn't really a hypothetical. That's actually what, what had happened. Uh, changing gears again, Director Ray, the FBI released se several 30-second video clips of a suspected pipe bomber seeking the public's help to identify him. Two of the video clips begin and end with the suspect already in the middle of the frame. You know how long the suspect pipe bomber was there and which way he exited, but you have withheld that information from the public. The FBI is in possession of the full tapes of the pipe bomb suspect and knows far more than the public about potential identifying details. You have begged the public's help in identifying this pipe bomb suspect. You even offered a $100,000 reward. Why have you not released the full tapes if you are truly intent in, in, to leverage the public's help? Will you commit to releasing the full tapes to the public immediately? Uh, no, sir, I can't make that commitment. I'm very careful about making sure that we protect the integrity of the ongoing investigation. And when we share information with the public while asking for their help, it has to be done very thoughtfully with regard to both the solicitation for assistance as well as, again, the protection of the integrity of the ongoing investigation. Well, I appreciate it. Well, in conclusion, I again urge the Capitol surveillance footage and the truth to be released in order to exonerate the innocent and to provide justice and accountability for those who violated it. I would like to ask for unanimous consent to enter into the record a report from Revolver News regarding infiltration and incitement of the January 6th protest by federal officials. Without objection. I thank the chairwoman, and with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. I recognize the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Mpumi, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and through you, my thanks to Chairman Oni for holding this hearing. It is indeed important, and the fact that it's the second one does not belie the fact that we have a situation that we've not faced in 100 years. And so two hearings on this, in my opinion, is proper, if not insufficient. And I hope that we have another one next month, as I think I heard earlier today. I want to thank um, the generals here for their service to the country and for their testimony today. I want to thank Director Ray and I want to thank also all the men of the, men, the FBI, nameless and faceless that we don't know, all across the country that are doing their job at this hour. Uh, Director Ray, I was happy to hear that you have doubled the number of investigations that are underway for racially and ethically motivated hate crimes against citizens, people who get up and pay their taxes every day. And so whether it's acts against African Americans or Latinos or Asian Americans as it has been recently or gay people or immigrants. I can only tell you that doubling those efforts is appreciated and if you want to triple them that would be appreciated because there's too much hate in this country and too many innocent people are being affected by it. I want all of us for just a moment to remember context here. We are here today because we were all fortunate enough to get more votes than the other person. And we got elected and we became members of the House of Representatives. And we took an oath this past January. And in the oath, we said we swore to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States from all enemies, foreign and domestic. The domestic enemies that we saw on January 6th ought to be the sort of things that we focus on. I know I've heard a lot of talk here about Hunter Biden's laptop and uh, the border attacks and crossings and Black Lives Matter, a movement that I, by the way, support, and even heard references to COVID. This has got to do with the attempts by people to overthrow the government of the United States of America something that hasn't happened in well over 100 years. And it's not something that we can slough off. You know, too often we hold fast to the conclusions of other people. Sometimes we subject all facts to a prefabricated set of interpretations. And quite often we enjoy the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. This requires thought. It requires action. It requires concentration. And we just can't slough it off and assume 
that it's not going to happen again. Most of you have heard the old story about Benjamin Franklin at the 1787 Constitutional Convention. When you walked outside after hours of deliberating, Miss Powell, a woman who was married to the mayor at the time, said to him, Dr. Franklin, tell us, what have you given us? Is it a monarchy or a republic? And as you know, Ben Franklin replied, ma'am, it's a republic if you can keep it. So that's what we are trying to do, keep our republic and to keep it from those who tried to overthrow this government, who wanted to kill members of Congress, who wanted to hang Mike Pence. All of you were in that gallery that day. I know I was. We saw what happened. Some of us made it back to our offices and places of lockdown. We knew at the time that this was unprecedented. And I hope we knew also that we have to find a way to make sure that it never, ever happens again. So I just want to make sure that we stay focused here. People all over the country are watching us. They know what this hearing is about. It is not about COVID-19. It is not about border crossings. It is not about Black Lives Matter. It's about a group of people who claim to be tourists and who some of you have referred to as patriots and purists, when in fact they were and are indeed provocateurs, pent up with an anger and a determination to overthrow that republic. So being here is important and hearing what everybody has to say is equally as important. <laughs> you know, a Greek philosopher was once asked, when would justice ever come to Athens? And he thought about it and he replied back thoughtfully, justice will never come to Athens until all of those who are not injured are just as indignant as all of those who are. This assault on our capital was an injury to millions of Americans, and we can never let it happen again. Madam Chair, I yield back any time I may have. Uh, the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Norman, is, rec you. is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I've been sitting here three hours, and we basically, and I want to thank the witnesses for, for coming, but really, the people that should be here are not here. The witnesses for the last three hours I've heard cannot really answer any questions or explain anything about what happened because it wasn't in their chain of command. Uh, the ones that should be here are the Capitol Police. Where are they? They're not here. Where is the acting chief, former Chief Sunderland? The chair has subpoena powers. Why isn't he here? Now, understand the, the, the chief now is Pittman. We're going to have her at another meeting, uh, but she's not here now. And I guess what's shocking, uh, we've had yet to have one hearing of all the crises that are going on in this, in this country, economic crisis, crisis, inflation is going through the roof. Uh, we've got a border crisis. Millions of people coming across unfettered, putting our police in danger, uh, coming across the border, we don't know who they are, not one hearing, not one hearing on the energy crisis. You ask that citizen about filling up with their car or truck with gas, what are they paying? 50% more. Where is the, the hearing on that? Our national security crisis. Where is our, our hearings? on what China's doing with their lab that's ongoing and with the investigation that's not happening on how the virus got here. Uh, where's our budget crisis? This administration is spending this country into a debt that's going to be hard to recover from. Where's our, our, where's our meeting and our hearing on that? Where's our criminal crisis? As has been said, we've had cities all over this country destroyed to the tune of two billion dollars over the past 60 days. Where's our our, our uh, meeting on that. Where's our hearing? Yet here we sit uh, for going on three hours over something that happened 160 days ago. We have yet to have one witness that really knows much of what's going on. And uh, it's a shame for the American people. Uh, the taxpayers deserve better. And we see the taxpayer what's going on. This is a shell game. This is, this is a dog and pony show to keep 
uh, to try to keep the emphasis off the real things that are affecting real Americans all over this country. Uh, the taxpayers get it. The, 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 the emphasis now is on anything but handling the crisis. And we have an administration that has not had a meaningful, um, meaningful hearing where the press asks any question other than where the, has the dog bitten anybody or is the cat lost? Uh, and so, Madam Chair, this is an insult. This is a, uh, something that I think the people are seeing through, and this is something that shouldn't happen. It's a waste of taxpayers' money, and it's, uh, it's a diversion that is not going to work. It's ridiculous. I yield the remaining part of my time back. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Johnson, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Director Ray, isn't it true that the FBI prepared a formal intent with a threat of setting protest by Black Lives Matter protesters in Washington, D.C.? Sorry, Congressman, I'm having a hard time getting a clear signal. Would you mind repeating the question? I'm sorry, isn't it the FBI prepared a formal intelligence bulletin with a threat assessment in advance of the summer 2020 protest by Black Lives Matter? I'm, I'm not aware of whether that's accurate in or not, sir. DC. Of course, whenever there is a high profile rally on the ellipse, which is to be attended by the president of the United States, correct? Uh, sir, I know that when there are certain events that are specifically designated as NSSE events or so-called SEER events, uh, which is a decision that's made by, I think, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, it is not unusual for the FBI to be asked in connection with those events to do a formal threat assessment. So I'm not okay, sure well, let me ask you this. in the instances here. Let me ask you this. The FBI did not produce a formal intelligence bulletin or a threat assessment in preparation for the January 6th insurrection, correct? Well, we did, we did produce uh, I think a dozen plus intelligence products. Well, uh, uh, including a, formal, a, a formal intelligence bulletin you did not produce. Is that correct? Well, I, we may just be inadvertently talking past each other on specific terms for specific kinds of intelligence products. We certainly put out a, a number of intelligence products, finished intelligence products, including two joint intelligence bulletins that I can think of, uh, as well as some others that were also finished you, products. Now, there is, I, there is a difference between those briefings that you're talking about and a, a formal intelligence bulletin produced in conjunction with the Department of Homeland Security, correct? Well, we did do formal intelligence bulletins with Department of Homeland Security. Uh, in I know preparation, I can think of at least two off the top of in preparation well, uh, over the six. Over the course of oh, preparation, did not do one in preparation for January six. Correct. Not specifically for the January six certification right. itself. I think that's now, the distinction. Now, the FBI yeah. in uh, 2020 December had received a packet of material from the New York Police Department that documented the real possibility that there would be violence at the Capitol on January 6th. And leading up to January 6th, based on intelligence that there was a real potential for violence in Washington, D.C. on that date, the FBI visited dozens of extremists already under investigation to discourage them from traveling to Washington, D.C. Isn't that correct? Uh, I don't know about the NYPD product because that, that's not ringing a bell as I sit here right now. But in terms of approaching individuals before January 6th, I don't know whether it was dozens, but I know there were individuals that we had inter interaction with. And my understanding is that none of those people had indicated an intention to attack the Capitol, certainly. But All right, well, let me, let, me move, let, me, let me move on. On January 5th, 
the FBI field office in Norfolk, Virginia issued a situational information report warning of an online post that discussed specific calls for violence against Congress on January 6th. And Director Ray, it's crystal clear to me that the FBI knew or certainly had reason to know that there was going to be violence at the Capitol on January 6th. And it's crystal clear that the FBI was more concerned about Black Lives Matter protesters in Washington, D.C. than it was about armed conflict by violent and armed Proud Boys and Oath Keepers descending on the United States Capitol. It's almost like the FBI wanted to look the other way so that the insurrection, insurrection could, uh, could proceed in its effort to stop the certification of the presidential election. That's what it appears to me and a lot of other people who are looking at this situation. Well, sir, I, I'm sorry if it appears that way. I, I, I don't agree with the characterization, but I can assure you that we are absolutely determined to make sure that nothing like what happened on January 6th ever happens again. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we elevated, I elevated, uh, racially motivated violent extremism, specifically racially motivated violent extremism, advocating for the superiority of the white race to uh, our highest threat priority in the summer of 2019 doubled the number of investigations we had into that type of threat and the number of arrests. But clearly, there's a lot more work to be done, and you can be sure the men and women of the FBI are absolutely determined to get it done. Thank you, sir, and I yield back. The, uh, the FBI director has asked for a short five-minute recess, so I declare that the committee is in recess for five minutes. <laughs>